Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Global Mapper webinar for February, February 2014. My name is David McKittrick, and joining me today for the webinar is Cassandra Quintel. Hello, David, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. From a relatively sunny Maine. It's been snowy for the last few days, but we finally saw a little bit of sun today, so we are, we are in a happy mood, right, Cassie? Yes, we are. The sun is shining. So today we are, are going to be covering a very basic topic. We're taking a big step back in a sense. We're going to uh, cover uh, getting started with Global Mapper. Um, we're going to find out in just a little bit where you stand, um, your level of proficiency. Um, we're not going to be talking about any advanced functionality, uh, any of the advanced analysis tools that we've dealt with in the past. This webinar is intended almost specifically for folks who are new to the software. So if you are a new user, a special welcome. Um, hopefully we'll give you enough information today that will help you understand uh, the way the global map works. And we like to say we can allow you to be dangerous with the software. Um, before we begin, there are a couple of housekeeping issues that we need to cover. Cassie. Yes, that's right. All webinar attendees are in listen-only mode. However, if you have a question, uh, you can use the questions tool on the go to panel, uh, go to webinar panel on the right of your screen. Uh, Blue Marble product specialists will try to answer your questions as they are submitted. And we'll also address any outstanding questions at the end of the presentation. That's right, and uh, you'll notice the geo help at bluemarblegeo.com uh, link, uh, link down there, the email address. Uh, we're always open for questions, uh, so if we don't get a chance to answer your question today or if you happen to be watching the recording of this and have a question about something that we cover, please uh, feel free to send an email. We'd like to uh, you know, turn those around as quickly as possible. Um, a few things are happening in the upcoming weeks and months. Uh, I've got some highlights here. Um, Cassie? Yeah, um, absolutely. You can see uh, some of our upcoming events on February 24th. We'll be at the URISA GIS CAMA uh, conference in Jacksonville, Florida. And then on March 10th, we'll be in Woodlands, Texas for the South Central ARC User Group Conference. And on March 23rd, we'll be at the um, ASPRS a conference down in Kentucky, and I'm actually going to be the one attending uh, that one uh, for uh, the one down in Kentucky. So if you're going to be attending any of these events, please feel free to stop by our booth and, and uh, see some of the demonstrations live or uh, to chat with uh, some of our uh, specialists at the booth. That's right, and actually I'm going to be at the uh, URISA conference, so we're both going on the road. The presentation in Jacksonville, or the conference in Jacksonville, I am delivering a presentation there, so I'd love to meet you if you're in that area. Um, again, that's uh, starting next week. Um, let's take a quick look at our agenda for today, what we're going to be covering. Um, these are very high-level bulleted points. Now, I'm assuming that there are those of you who have stumbled in today that have not actually started using Global Mapper. So we're going to cover the initial installation of the software and the registration. We, we get a lot of questions about registering, so we're hopefully going to simplify, show you how simple the process is. Um, we'll talk about some of the optimal settings and configuration options. Um, I'm also going to bring in some of the navigational structure. How do you find your way around the software? Where do you go to find um, relevant functionality? So we'll cover that. Um, one of the basic components of Global Mapper is its ability to import or ingest data. So uh, Cassie's going to be covering the access and importing of data of uh, various formats. Efficient layer and file management. If you don't remember anything else about the webinar today, I'm going to suggest you pay attention at this stage. Or even for those of you who have been using the software for a while, I'm hoping you're going to find this useful. Um, the way to manage your files efficiently. We're going to be talking about workspace files and what they are and what they're not. So um, efficient layer and file management is a key part of our presentation today. Um, we are going to be talking about the digitizer. The digitizer is the drawing function, the, the tool that lets you either create or modify vector features on the map. And we're going to be going through a, a couple of very simple little workflows where we use the digitizer. And no uh, presentation on GIS would be complete without dealing with the sharing process. How do we get data out of the application? How do we share data? Um, so we'll, we'll, find, we'll wrap up our session this after, later this afternoon with a short section on sharing. Now, as you can see, even based on these six bullets, there's a lot to cover. Um, uh, Cassie and I were discussing this this morning, and really the challenge in this webinar is not what to put in, but what to leave out. This is not a fully-fledged training class. Um, we do have options for that. In fact, if you look at our website, we've got a long list of training opportunities 
opportunities are available, perhaps there's going to be one in your part of the world. Check that out if you want more detailed instruction. Now, this today, this presentation is going to be a very basic introduction, giving you uh, enough information to get started. A um, couple of things before we go. This, this uh, presentation is actually derived from a document that we put together about a year ago that's actually included with the application. You'll notice I have a global mapper on my screen right now. I'm clicking on the help menu. Um, right here, second option is a getting started guide. This is a PDF. Um, loosely uh, paralleling what we're going to be doing today, this provides more uh, instructions, and again, on the getting started process, lots of screenshots in there, uh, you know, defining all the functions of the software. So if you want to do a little homework, if you like, go ahead and grab that. It's about a 20-page document, and it'll give you uh, more, sometimes more detailed information that we're going, to, we're going to have time to cover today. So, before we actually begin, this is a little bit of a change from our usual pattern, we're going to conduct a poll. Um, the poll you will see on your screen in just a second is going to ask you a very simple question. We're going to ask you how competent you feel about your capability in Global Mapper. Now, you'll see there are five options here. Um, I'm hoping that there's nobody in attendance today that would consider themselves to be a five. If that's the case, you're probably in the wrong webinar. Um, Looking at the results as they're coming in already, I notice most of you would consider yourselves to be one. That is why we do this. That's why we're here today giving you this information. Um, grade yourself. This is a self-assessment process. Give yourself a score, and in a few seconds here, we'll close up the poll, and I'll turn it around so you can see the results, so you, you can see who you're sharing the webinar with today. It's a battle between one and two right now. We, we have a few people who understand the basics. Um, Thankfully, nobody's a five. That's good. <laughs> we didn't want to be talking to the fives today. So just another couple of seconds on this one. And we will go ahead and close. Now, in a second, you will see the results. You'll see what your fellow web webinar attendees, uh, where they fit in. Uh, most of you understand the basics. Well, hopefully we can provide a little more information for you today. Uh, we have a couple that were uh, familiar with most of the features and functions. Well, again, hopefully we're going to give you some direction, maybe straightening out some of your bad habits that you've d adopted. Um, those of you, the 37% who are complete novices, this is going to be particularly useful for you today. So, so thank you for participating in our poll. Let's go ahead and we'll, we'll hide that window. And I am going to hand over to Cassandra to talk a little bit about getting, getting started. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, like he said, I am going to uh, talk a little bit about registering the software. Um, Global Mapper can be downloaded directly from the Blue Marble website. Uh, so feel free to go to the website if you haven't downloaded Global Mapper already. Um, this is open distribution of the software. So it's free to download. Anybody can download it. And we would encourage you to download it as well. Uh, we do offer it in a 32 and a 64-bit version. Uh, today we'll be using the 64-bit version. And you can see that um, right up at the the title bar at the top of the window, it says 64-bit. Uh, you might also notice that we offer uh, the software package in, in a couple of other languages as well. So if you happen to be um, in another country and you're more proficient um, in another language, you might offer the software um, in your language as well. Um, after uh, the program is installed and you open it, you will see the registration screen. And if uh, David is gracious enough to let me control his mouse, I um, can navigate to the um, help menu to show you uh, how you can get to the registration screen um, if it doesn't automatically pop up for you. My apologies, Cassandra. I'm, I'm asleep at the wheel here. All right. Uh, so there's the help menu, and register global mapper is right down towards the middle. Um, and this box might automatically pop up for you um, if, if this is the first time you're, you're opening Global Mapper. Um, and now you can see uh, there is a couple options for registration. Uh, the first one, you can use an order number. And to obtain an order number, you can actually make a purchase rate online through our website again. Um, after you make the purchase, you'll be provided with that number, and it will unlock the full version of the software. Uh, you can connect to a network license, uh, you can select a license file, or you can request a two-week free trial license. So again, if you're new to Global Mapper and you want to try it out and see some of the functionality, I would really encourage you to take a look at the free two-week trial. But for today, we're going to select a license file. So I, I click the little option and click Register Me. And uh, right here, I have my license file um, available, and I'm going to click Open. 
Uh, this pop-up box is indicating that there are modules available. And with the release of Global Mapper version 15, um, we've added the LiDAR toolbar and the Global Energy Mapper, or the GEM module, uh, to the software. Um, these modules do require a special license, so if you're interested in, in either one of these modules, please feel free to contact our sales department and they can get you set up with that. For today, we're just going to be using uh, the, the basic global mapper, and we're not going to activate either one of those modules, so we're going to just click OK. Um, those modules can be activated again through the Help menu, and there's the Module and Extension License Manager. And here you can select the GEM, uh, the LiDAR, or the OTF uh, modules, and you can click Register, and that will bring you to that same registration screen. Also on the right hand side you'll see uh, there's two extensions, the overview extension and the coast extension. Uh, these are free and available uh, to anyone that's using Global Mapper and you can activate those right from this window as well. But for today we'll just um, leave it again just as the standard. Um, uh, with the network licensing, uh, we do provide access to uh, the software for, uh, for company-wide. So if there's multiple users of the software within your company, I would probably direct you towards the network licensing. Uh, there's no physical restriction uh, to the network licenses. Um, so if there's a number of people using it, again, it will, it will provide that broad access across the entire company. Uh, with the network licenses, we also offer a borrow feature where you can check the network license um, off the network and use it while you're away or in the field or whatnot. And our final licensing option is a USB dongle hardware license. And this license actually lives on a, a little USB key that you would plug into your computer and activate Global Mapper on that machine. So it's a really convenient way to be able uh, to move the license around if you're using machines or in multiple offices or whatnot. So with an active license, um, you, uh, you'll see the screen, and I think David's going to talk a little bit about navigating the interface. Sure, I am. That's right. Uh, before we go, I'm starting to see some of the questions come in. Thank you for asking this to you. Uh, do, you. do I need a separate license for all users in my company? That's a good one relevant to what you just covered. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the single user licenses are intended to be used uh, by one person, primarily on one machine, um, and the network license is really designed uh, to provide that broad access across the company. Um, again, one seat could serve multiple users depending on your the use of the software, and we bundle the network licenses generally in two, five, and ten seat or concurrent users. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Cassie. You, you'll notice, by the way, now that the application is, uh, has been registered, there are a couple of subtle differences in the interface. We didn't point these out at the start. Uh, with the unregistered version, we had a buy now option up here. That would obviously allow you to click through and purchase the license. Um, also, it says registered. I feel comfortable. I have registered the software. Um, my registration option is no longer available because I am registered. One thing to, to reiterate, to make sure you're aware of as a new user, you do have the option of trying this out for a couple of weeks. You don't have to purchase initially. Go through that trial process. We'll activate you for two weeks. You can go through the entire functionality. We do limit the exports because we, we don't want to have you go through an entire workflow. But functionally, you'll get everything you'll get in the full version, and you can try it out. Then you can upgrade to a full license. So, so yeah, we now have a fully functional licensed version of the software. I feel empowered. This is great. Let's give you a quick navigation, a quick overview of the software. Again, primarily intended for those of you who were in the one class, the novices, the folks who have not used the software. Typical Windows layout. We have got menus at the top of the screen. We have of toolbar buttons. So these are essentially shortcuts to what we would consider to be commonly used functions. I'm going to show you a few things that you may want to be aware of. Um, let's look first at the view menu. The view menu includes a number of options, including, as you'll see right at the top, a toolbars option. This allows you to control the toolbars. Now, intimidating with a lot of context perhaps because without understanding the functionality in the toolbars you may not feel qualified enough to make these decisions but eventually if for instance you never use GPS you can disable that toolbar 
cleans up the interface. It allows you just to streamline the way it's laid out based on your requirements. Um, the tools toolbar, the view toolbar, all of these can be customized. These buttons can be customized. Now, each of these is an individual toolbar. I'm going to pick my tools up, and I'm actually going to drag that, and you'll see it actually sits on top of the interface itself. So you can individually manipulate these individually manipulate these collections of tools and place them where it's most relevant for you. Um, so as you can see, I've moved my toolbar uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, the screen itself and moved it back again. I'm just going to refresh my screen really quickly here. There we go. Okay, what else? One of the comments that we get from a lot of new users is related to the background color, the default color. We haven't actually loaded any maps up yet. We haven't brought in any data. Cassie's going to do that in a few minutes. But that background color is something you might want to change. It's a, it defaults to a yellowish color, which is fine in certain situations. But there are folks who want maybe a cleaner color, maybe a, a dark color, if they want to see some contrast with their layers that they're working with, or perhaps a light color. My preference is for white. And the way that I change my background color is from the view menu and you have a background color option here as well and as you can see it's a simple little color picker you choose whatever you want you'll see I have already chosen white as my background color you simply click OK that's a universal setting that is going to exist until you choose at some point to change it to another color on occasion I will have to toggle it to another color if I want to see over uh, in my case I overrode the um, uh, the standard color that's uh, uh, applied to the uh, default software I want to draw attention specifically now to a component of the toolbar, which is what we refer to as our tools. Um, these tools are your primary way of interacting with features on the map. We have a zooming tool, as you'll see when my cursor is located, a panning tool, a measuring tool, a feature info tool. Uh, we're going to get to that one in just a little bit. A couple of specialized tools, view shared and path profile. And we have our digitizer. And as I said before, during my introduction, we're going to be spending a little time later talking about the digitizer. Now, the reason I'm drawing your attention to this array of functions is because one of these needs to be selected. This defines the functionality of your cursor. And you'll see, as you choose one of these, I've just chosen my view shared tool, a, t a tip will appear. As a new user of the software, you will be prompted with this useful information in an interactive, dynamic way. Depending on what it is you select in the software, you'll see a little tells you how to perform that function. Obviously, it's not going to a lot of detail. You can get that in the help documentation, but it provides a high-level view of what exactly it is that you've clicked on. Obviously, if you do not want to see this next time, you can de uh, select this box and turn it off, and it will disappear. So just the toolbars, as I said, the, the um, tools, rather, are, are what define the behavior of the cursor. And as we get into looking at some map data itself, um, that will become a little more clear. Let's take a look at the configuration dialog box. This is the heart and soul of the settings of the software. Uh, again, it's a catch-22 situation in terms of when you visit this component. Do you wait till you've imported data, or do you do this as a starting point? Well, I'm going to do it right now before we've actually imported any data. I'm going to apply some configuration settings. This option, by the way, is also available from the Tools menu. Configure, as you'll see right to, at the bottom. I'm going to use the button that looks like a wrench and a screwdriver. I'm just going to pop up that window. As you'll see in the configuration dialog box, there are a number of tabs defining the, the settings for individual components of the software, individual uh, aspects of the software. General is where I'm going to start. The general tab, as its name implies, allows you to establish what we would define as general settings. Uh, for instance, a global mapper by default will not display a grid on the screen, but you can choose to have it display a grid. It will superimpose a grid in whatever uh, projection uh, is currently loaded, or on that long grid if you choose, and that will appear on every map view that you have. It will be relative to the current view you're displaying. You could turn that on or off as needed. Again, a universal setting. You can also customize it if you uh, get to be a more advanced user. Some of the other configuration settings that are useful in this uh, general tab, units of measure. We often get this question, how do I change the units of measure? Well, this is where this is universally controlled. My area units can be controlled and my distance units. So again, universal setting, apply it here, and it's good throughout your use of the software. 
I also want to show you some of the options under vector display. Now, vector uh, display would um, affect how you interact with points, lines, and area features on the map. And we're going to be dealing with those specifically in just a little bit. There are a couple of suggestions I'm going to make right off the bat. And this is getting a little more specific, but you'll thank me for this one. Um, under the uh, checkbox list at the bottom of this screen, you will notice an option that says only highlight border of selected area features, and that is off by default. Basically what this means is when you select an object, let's say it's an area that you've created and you select it, it will highlight the border to make it a lot more easy to see. And I want to go ahead and check that one because we're going to see that behavior a little bit later when we get into working with the digitizer. That is one thing I recommend that you do. It's a cleaner way of selecting, a cleaner way of visualizing features on, uh, on the map. Also within this vector display area, we have tools for filtering. Um, we can filter areas, lines, points, and as you'll see, I'm going to click on the areas list. There are a number of pre-configured area types that are included with the software. I'm going to talk in a little bit more, more detail about that in just a second. But if you never, for instance, map golf courses, you can uncheck that as an option, and it will not appear in the list of available features. In fact, you can uncheck all of these and create your own list of features. I'm going to cover that in just a second, and you'll see how that works. But we have filtering tools in here for limiting what's available and limiting what would be displayed on the screen. I'm just going to cancel this for the time being. You can also opt not to display all of your areas or all of your lines or all of your points. And I find that to be particularly useful if I want to quickly see what my rivers look like without the, the uh, whatever the area features or points that are displayed as well. I just want to limit it to one particular type of feature. This again is a universal setting. My suggestion is whatever configuration you apply in that context, just remember what you've done because I've had situations where I apply a filter or change a setting, forget that I've done it and can't figure out why my map won't cooperate. Just remember what you've done I guess is the moral of the story. Another tab I want to point out is the projection tab. Now, we don't have any data loaded right now, but we will in a second. But the projection tab allows you to reproject the map. Essentially, whatever the projection parameters, whatever the coordinate system that's used when you import a layer, that can be changed. Prior to exporting, you can change that, and it will apply whatever you set in here to the exported file. This con uh, configuration projection tab is Global Mapper's reprojection function. This is where you'll go to reproject. One final tab I want to show you, and that's my area styles. Now, area, line, and point styles are all essentially the same function. This, as I showed you a few seconds ago, reflects the available types of features that can be created within uh, a global mapper. You'll notice one towards the bottom called unknown area. If you start to create features on the map and you don't pay any attention to the dialog box, you will create what's called an unknown feature. I would recommend against uh, doing that. I would recommend assigning features to a type. And we are going to go through the process of actually creating our own. I'm going to create a new type of feature, and I want to call it parcels. Now my parcels, when I draw them on my map, are going to be a solid fill. I want to make them a nice bright red color so we can actually see them. Um, I could define the border style. I can do all of the visual, visualization. So this allows me to predetermine what this feature will look like. And I'll just click OK. So I now have this list called par this uh, uh, area type called parcels. I'm also going to manage the attributes for this type. Now let me give you a kind of a, a, a forewarning of what's to come. Next month we're going to be dealing in more detail with attribute management. This is just a kind of a scraping the surface. Attributes essentially uh, represents the data that's associated with features you create or import. Uh, all the information that's associated with those features. I'm going to add an attribute to this and I'm going to call this attribute owner. So for every feature that's created with this type, there will be an available attribute that the user can fill out called owner. And uh, my colleague Cassandra is going to be actually do doing this with the digitizer a little bit later. And we'll just simply click OK again and click OK. So we have created a new attribute, a new feature that we can assign to uh, the, the digitized functions. And that basically is a quick overview of some of the primary elements of the software. We're going to deal with what really where you normally are going to begin, and that's uh, importing data.
All right. Uh, a big part of GIS is um, actually using and looking at and interpreting data. And with Global Mapper, there are many ways to get data into the software. Um, as you can see right here on your screen, there are four buttons. Uh, the top button, open your own uh, data file. Or you can download free online data, and you have some options for display um, and settings, and then load sample data. And the software does come uh, with some sample data loaded in, but for today, um, we're uh, going to go to File and Open Data. Um, again, this is going to act the same way if you were to select the blue button on the screen, um, but like I said, there are many ways to get data into Global Mapper. Um, I'm going to navigate uh, to the imagery, and I'm going to actually open up this um, JPEG file. This is going to be a raster data set. And this is uh, Hollowell, Maine. We're actually located uh, right around here. Let me uh, change my tool, and I will zoom in on uh, this my ortho imagery. Uh, you might wonder how I got uh, this data clipped so neatly. Um, a way to do that is actually through... Um, the Overlay Control Center. Uh, the Overlay Control Center is, a, is your layer management tool. If I had multiple layers loaded in, you would see them all listed here um, in the Overlay Control Center. And you can see my, my Hollowell uh, JPEG loaded up. And you can select the Options button. With this, you'll have uh, your raster options. Uh, you can set your display, your color intensity, the transparency, uh, the blend modes, which is uh, quite fun to play with if you happen to have a couple of raster layers loaded up. Um, you can also do your color and contrast adjustments. And right here, here's your, your cropping tab. So I was able to download um, a shape file and the outline for the town of Hollowell, and I was able to clip uh, my ortho imagery to that polygon, and as you can see the border right here, um, it inherited that, that uh, new shape. And again, that's done right through the options dialog. If you have a multi-band um, raster layer loaded up, you can control uh, your color bands, uh, and we have the feathering option, and then uh, color grade as well. So there's a, a number of different options you can do to, to manipulate or change up your, your raster layer that you may have loaded in. Um, we'll, we can load in a couple of others as well, so we'll click OK to, to get out of the box. Um, we can load in, another way to load in data is uh, by dragging and dropping. And let me see if I can navigate um, to a window here. Let me see. I'm not sure if it's working for me. Oh, no, oh, and it doesn't look like it's loaded up. Um, but if you needed to, you could actually uh, click and drag and drop the file into the map window. And that's a really easy way to be able to get data in. You can also select uh, this um, open file button um, right here on the left-hand side. Now let's load in uh, the parcel data set for Hollowell as well. Uh, this is, I believe, a shape file uh, containing the parcels uh, for the city of Hollowell. Uh, let's see if it loads in for me. There we go. And as you can see, I previously loaded in. Uh, with Global Mapper, um, the way it's listed in the Overlay Control Center is actually the draw order. and then the parcel layer. So essentially, I'm going to be uh, bot bottoms up, if you will. Uh, so the, you see the parcel layers on top of uh, the ortho uh, There's a number of other ways to load in data as well. Uh, Global Mapper supports spatial databases. So if, if your company or you have a spatial database already set up, uh, Global Mapper will connect into that. And this open all files in directory is a way to um, batch import data. So if you have a bunch of information or, or files located um, up once using this file command. Uh, the open ASCII data uh, is a way to read in text files. I'm actually going to unload uh, what I have. 
Cassie, while you're doing that, I'm going to mention one thing. This is There are a number of keyboard shortcuts in Global Mapper. Um, there's a, a list you can get in our help documentation. You can actually create your own as well. That's a whole other uh, component of the software. But the one keyboard shortcut you may find useful, like you didn't see what Cassie was doing on the keyboard, but it's Control and the letter U on your keyboard. Extremely useful. That's the wipe the slate clean function. Sorry, Cassie. Oh, no, that's great. I mean, actually, would you be able to navigate uh, to the Kennebec County's text file um, so we can open it up and see what this um, actually looks like? Sure. Let me uh, go up one level here. Let's uh, go to our, our data folder and text. So uh, this is the file that Cassie's going to be working with. Great. Um, so this file, it contains uh, the x and y, the coordinates for uh, this a particular uh, polygon, and we'll be able to open this up in Global Mapper uh, using that ASCII file command. Uh, oops, there we go. Thank you. Get back into the application and to open the ASCII text file command, and it's going to um, ask you to navigate to the location of the data, which we see it's in the text and Kennebec County. And it's going to bring up this um, import options dialog box. And this is specific to uh, the ASCII text files. Uh, this file where you're going to um, import the points, lines, and polygon features. It's going to ask you the order of the coordinate system. For this particular file, um, actually Y is first. So it's going to be the Y or northern uh, latitude coordinate first. Uh, the, the rest of this side is going to stay as default. Over on the right hand side we're going to use this auto detect function um, and then you can specify the specific uh, feature types. We're going to leave it as unknown for today but right down here at the bottom there's an option to create an area um, from the closed uh, lines. So if you have uh, coordinates, if your first coordinate and your last coordinate have the same um, system or the same coordinate, it's going to actually create a closed feature for you. And for this case, we want to create that closed feature. So we'll make sure that box is checked and we're going to click OK. It's going to ask me for the projection. And again, this um, particular file is set up in lat long in WGS84. So we're going to leave it as is and click All right. Are okay, and it's going to open up. This is the polygon for Kennebec County. So again, it's a really easy way to be able to import data if you have it in not necessarily a, a traditional GIS format. Um, you can open it up uh, text files as well. Uh, finally, I'm going to uh, talk about our online data source. Um, you can access it through this little globe here on the toolbar or through the uh, file menu. So when you open this up, uh, you're going to be presented with um, a number of online uh, resources that are provided standard with Global Mapper. Uh, looks like it's taken a minute for it to load in. Um, but you'll see in just a minute here that the data is uh, categorized uh, by generally the type of data. Ah, there it is. Uh, so we got our popular sources up here at the top, our premium sources, our imagery, and a number of other things, including uh, land cover, terrain. Uh, some of these on this list come standard, and other ones are added. Um, the main one, for instance, in the New Hampshire one, that was um, added by David. And to be able to do that, um, you can select the Add New Sources uh, button. And it's going to prompt you for the type. We'll just uh, click in so I can show you the dialog box here. Um, it's going to ask you for the URL that uh, the server is on, um, what, what, who is hosting the data or what the data is hosted. And you can click the Get List button. And it's going to populate a list down here of the uh, data that's available uh, on that server or at that URL. Um, after you select your data type, uh, you can specify the specific bounds of the data. Uh, so if I only wanted to import data for uh, Kennebec County that I have loaded up, I could select uh, the option uh, down here uh, for the current bounds or within or whatnot. So there's definitely a number of ways to be able to get data into Global Mapper. And we provide um, some pretty awesome resources uh, to get starting if you don't happen to have any data sets available for your project area.
Yeah, and just just to reiterate what Cassie just said, and this what we have included with the uh, install of the software are a number of pre-configured services that are available. Most of these are free, by the way. Um, the premium services that uh, uh, Cassie referred to, those would usually require a subscription of some sort. But the vast majority of these services are free. We've added them. We've added a few since the release of version 15.1. Even um, if you're with especially there are a lot of free data sets and uh, as Cassie mentioned um, very often you will access to these services are available at a local level it's just a matter of going and adding on that, that source workflow suggestion if you're connecting to this remote data um, and by the way the imagery that uh, Cassie displayed a few minutes ago was accessed using this service I would suggest exporting the data rather than relying on that continual connection. Uh, one of the questions we get quite commonly is that the data I was trying to get yesterday is no longer available. Unfortunately, that's out of our control. If the service is down, the service is down. We don't control them. So as a workflow uh, rule, if you're accessing data online and you want to have that available continually, export the area view you're interested in. You have it locally as a file then. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about exporting. So. Thank you, Cassie. Uh, I'm looking at a very interesting question here. Um, somebody asked, uh, is there an annual f fee for Global Mapper? Do you have to pay an annual fee? Well, there is, actually, and I would rather, I'd like you to make your checks payable to David McKittrick. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is no annual fee for Global Mapper. You purchase a license, that is your license uh, perpetually. There is no annual fee required. Um, the license is yours. We do encourage you to consider, up, consider upgrading. Uh, as you will have known, if you visit or you stopped into the webinars before, we add a lot of functionality on a year-to-year -year basis. So certainly something you want to keep current with, but you do not have to pay. You do not have to pay to keep your current license active. So thank you for that question. And again, keep, keep those questions coming in. So. Which brings us to what I would consider to be the most important part of today's uh, webinar, and that's efficient file management. Now, I'm just going to leave what Cassie had done on the screen right now. She imported a text file, had Global Mapper interpret those points as an area feature, and she created this really nice outline of the county that we're sitting in right here in Maine. Let's say it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon, if, if only, and it's time to go home, and we want to pick this map up where we left off. We want to, have to, we want to save this. When we save uh, a map view or we save the data that we have uh, loaded into Global Mapper, what we save is what's called a workspace. And you will see on the toolbar a save button right here, second button from the left, save workspace. We also have an option under the file menu to save workspace. You can uh, uh, even save workspace as. I'm going to get to that in just a sec. Saving a workspace allows you to save the current configuration. Now, let's go ahead and do that. Because this workspace has not previously been saved, I'm going to be prompted to give it a name. I'm just going to call this one test because I don't have any imagination. My test workspace has now been saved right on my desktop. And if I were to navigate to my desktop, I would find a file there with a .gmw suffix, global mapper workspace. I could load additional data. I could load shape files. I could load imagery. I could load all sorts of data and save each time, save the, uh, the data that's been loaded. However, by saving a workspace, you're not actually saving the map data itself. The workspace, if we were to cut it open, would provide us with the path to the source file, wherever that file happened to be. In this case, it would be the text file that, that Cassie had previously imported. Or with the imagery that she had in previously, it would have been the path to the directory that contained that imagery. The workspace would remember that path. If, for whatever reason, that path was broken, Global Mapper would not be able to load up the imagery. Now, that's important because a workspace is not a file containing map data, per se, but it is a configuration file. It tells Global Mapper what data to load and ultimately how to display that data. If you want to change the colors or, or make a modification, if you want to delete a feature, if you want to move features around, those are all recorded in your workspace. But the original data is what's being read. So my workspace file, if I were to open it, would define the source of the points that you are used to create this particular polygon. Now that's important because we get a lot of people who import a file, import a shape file. Ha ha, I've got it in Global Mapper. That's great. I'll simply hit the save button and I can delete the shapefile. I'm done with it. That doesn't work. The shapefile is always going to have a role to play. So a workspace file is a file that lets you store your configuration in Global Mapper. A workspace file isn't a file containing map. Now I'm going to contradict myself just a little bit. 
the next section of our, our webinar is going to be talking about the digitizer tool. If I use the digitizer tool and I create a nice little rectangle over here in the corner of my map, well, that rectangle didn't originate with a file that I imported, so, so it has to reside somewhere. And in that case, it does reside in the workspace. So anything, any drawing or feature creation that you're embarking on will be saved as part of that workspace. Another important consideration is if I hit the Save button, I'm going to just make a, a modification to this feature. I'm just going to um, select it. And again, Cassie will go into the details on the digitizer a little bit later. But I'm just going to move this entire feature slightly to the east. Now, that change has not been applied to the original file. If I save my file right now, the save is only saved in the workspace. And again, it's a question that we get quite frequently. I import a shapefile. I want to make some changes. I want to add some features. I want to modify the attributes. I want to change the color. Is that going to affect the original file? Well, no, it's not. In fact, Global Mapper cannot, in its current form, edit a shapefile in that way. If I wanted to, ch uh, to apply my changes to the source file, I would have to export and override the file that I had imported. So it's a manual process requiring some very specific steps. Global Mapper manages data internally and allows you to export the results. So a workspace, going back to where we started, is a file that allows you to save your configuration within Global Mapper. There is no limit to the number of workspaces you, can, you create. You could have a workspace for every job you do, for every geographic area that you work in. You can have workspaces that view the same data layers and just configure them in different ways. You could have a shapefile with uh, all of the towns in Maine and have it displayed in a certain way in one workspace and in a different way in another. It opens up a lot of possibilities as far as data management in Global Mapper is concerned. Bottom line is, at the end of the day, you will want to make sure you hit that Save button. If you want to make a modification but keep what you had done previously, Save as. It's just like any other file management system, we can keep the original workspace intact and save a version of it, maybe if you want to experiment with some different colors or something of that type. So workspace management is key to understanding Global Mapper. Um, again, if you want to refer back to the Getting Started document, which is included with the software, it goes into more detail exactly what a workspace is. So, Any other questions coming in, Cassandra? Uh, yeah, there are a couple other questions. Um, a question came in, how do I share data with another Global Mapper user? Uh, good question. Um, <laughs> this is a very relevant question, actually, because the workspace file that I refer to, I just created a file, and you'll see it's called test right on the top of my screen here. You'll see it says uh, uh, test.gmw. We know that a lot of people think they can share those files, you know, attach it to an email, it's a relatively small file, send it to another Global Mapper user. The result of that will typically be some sort of error because that path that I mentioned before, the path to the original data, it would not be relevant on someone else's machine. So I guess how you don't share data is using workspace files. Um, the method for sharing data is what we call, call a global mapper package. I'm going to hold off on going into more detail until the final section of our webinar where we're going to talk about sharing. But yes, sharing data, um, essential part of the software and sharing data with other global mapper users is typically done through uh, what we call a global mapper package file. Great. Thank you, David. Um, with that, we'll actually move into the digitizer tool. Uh, David briefly mentioned it um, with being able to move the polygon uh, for Kennebec County. And I'll explain a little bit more about the digitizer tool. Um, as you saw, it's activated uh, right up here on the toolbar. It's this pencil with the little squiggly line after it. After selecting it, it's going to make the map window active. And you can see that my cursor says edit mode. Uh, this means it allows you to, to edit any features that you currently have on screen. I don't have anything loaded up or drawn at the moment, but we'll get to that in just a second. Um, there is a right click option where you can create uh, your lines, your area features, or your points or text features uh, right from the right click menu. But also you'll see um, this second toolbar, the lower toolbar here, um, this is actually the, uh, the digitizer toolbar. The first couple of buttons right here on the left hand side are to create uh, polygon or area features. Then it moves to line features and um, range rings, 
Pogo tool, um, a grid, and then it moves into our points um, and text features and a couple of other features. These uh, buttons grayed out here on the right hand side, they'll become active depending on uh, what type of feature you have selected. So these are all used um, to modify or edit uh, features that have already been selected. Uh, for today, we'll uh, create an area feature. I'll select the button, and you'll see that my cursor uh, changes uh, to a crosshairs and the word area below it. Uh, to start to create a feature, uh, you can right-click, and it's going to place a point. And you can continue right-clicking uh, to make the feature uh, whatever shape you want it to be. Now, generally, when you're working with GIS, um, you're not going to just start out by creating random features on the map. You might have some data loaded in, or you might be tracing a feature or whatnot. Um, but for this example, we'll just arbitrarily draw a polygon. Uh, to close the polygon and to complete it, you can left click. And it's going to bring up the feature info box. Uh, Global Mapper has the unique ability to simply name the feature. Um, today, I, we'll just call it test. Below it, um, it's going to ask you to select the feature type. Now, David uh, talked about this previously in the configuration dialog box. And he created um, a feature called uh, parcels. So let's select that um, feature type right here. And uh, right below, you're going to see the feature styling changes uh, um, in, is determined by the feature type. Uh, you can also customize the styling uh, if you don't want uh, it to look that way. But for today, we'll just, we'll just leave the default styling. Uh, next, you'll see the feature layer. Um, this is going to tell you uh, what layer to put it in. So if I, if I have data loaded up, you can add it to a data that's currently, or a layer that's currently loaded. Um, but for today, we're going to create a new layer. I would actually uh, recommend not necessarily putting all of your user-created features into this user-created uh, feature box. Um, this can get kind of convoluted or, or congested within there if you're adding a lot of features that might not be related or whatnot. Creating a new layer is definitely an easier way to be able to manage uh, your feature creation. And after selecting this feature type, you'll see that uh, David had added an owner um, attribute field. We can edit that so that we can um, add an owner. Uh, so we're going to, we'll say Sam Knight is the owner of this parcel, and click OK. And you can see it's added to the attribute list. And when you click OK out of the box, it's going to ask you to name the layer. So I had uh, created a new one, so let's call it parcels, uh, and click OK. And you'll see that the parcel layer was added to my overlay control center. And uh, the name of the parcel is uh, displayed in, in the middle of the polygon. And it, the polygon obviously took the characteristics of the styling as uh, designated. If I want to continue editing, I can um, add some more. And you might notice um, my cursor snaps to uh, the created uh, uh, line or point that's uh, already on the map. So snapping is an easy way to be able uh, to make sure that parcels are joined or any of the data is joined. And if you see when I move to the top of the map window, my cursor changes to this arrow. Um, it's an easy way to be able to navigate around uh, the map window and pan um, from side to side if you're right on the edge. Um, so we can uh, just create another polygon uh, and right click to complete it and it's going to draw that line down for me and again you're presented with the modify feature info box it's a very common thing to see it's kind of one of the, the cornerstones of uh, global mapper is this modify feature box we can click cancel um, and it's just going to leave them as default Oops, it's going to ask me to save it um, I'm going to say no and click OK so then the, the parcel is now saved if I um, unselect my create area features, again, I'm brought back to my cursor with the words um, edit below. And I can select my created polygon. And you can see that it's outlined to show that it's selected. Um, with it selected, you uh, have a lot of options in the right click menu. Again, you can bring back uh, that modified feature info box by going to the edit option. You can also uh, delete the area. You can move it. Um, you can modify each one of the vertices, um, remove vertices, reshape the feature. There's a whole list of things you can do uh, within the right-click menu. 
so I would recommend that you explore these options uh, to see uh, what would match your workflow or some specific needs that you might have uh, with working with this uh, vector data set. Hey, Cassie, I'm just noticing, I'm just going to back up something that Cassie said a minute ago. This idea of digitizing on a blank screen is, is very unrealistic. It's unlikely that you would ever embark on a process where you start with a blank slate and just arbitrarily draw. In the world that we live in, we just want to show the tool as opposed to something useful. In your world, your drawing may be based on tracing something from an image or a topographic map or from what's called Kogo. I know Cassie was not intending to show Kogo, but I'll If you saw logo, I'm just going to check a point on the screen. You can define the dimensions of an area based on its known dimensions, the distance and bearing for every line segment. So you can be very precise in how this is created. And again, just to show the tool, uh, we're using this arbitrary uh, shape. Looking at some more questions here coming in, um, uh, we have a question on... Uh, the uh, creating points. How do you create points? Um, I think Cassie mentioned briefly we have a, a tool here in the toolbar, a little point tool, uh, process of creating points. I'm just drop a point on the uh, screen. Exactly the same dialog box that Cassie brought up with the, uh, at the area tool. Again, assigning a name to this point feature, assigning a feature type, assigning it to a layer, and assigning attribution. So this modify feature info dialog box is going to uh, be, uh, recur throughout the digitizing process. I'm just going to cancel this for the time being. So um, let's talk a little bit about exporting. I'm looking at the clock here, and we're, we're getting towards the, the top of the hour. And I'm going to leave uh, Cassie's artwork on the screen here, and we'll just uh, use this as the basis for, for, for exporting. Um, let's assume we had uh, spent a lot of time actually creating something useful. Um, as I mentioned before, in the context of the workspace, if I simply want to leave this as is, perhaps picking it up tomorrow, we simply save the workspace. And again, this is an unsaved workspace right now, so I'd simply save. But again, that just saves it within the context of, of a global mapper specific format, allowing me to bring the same data with the same configuration settings up uh, uh, during my next session. Um, Ultimately, you're going to want to be able to share this with folks outside of your world, outside of the world of Global Mapper, and certainly, um, you know, either your constituents, your colleagues, or whoever that might be. And the process for getting data out is a very simple one. In the file menu, um, where we started today's session, where we were talking about opening data, we also have a number of options right here at the bottom for exporting data. I'm going to draw your attention first to the. Uh, the first item on this list, a global mapper package file. If you have not already uh, used this format or you're not familiar with this format, I strongly encourage you to, to be aware of it and to use it when it's applicable because this is the format of data that is specifically intended for global mapper use. It's intended for use within the software um, and it will save not only a single layer but multiple layers, vector layers, elevation layers, uh, raster layers, all in one compressed file. Now, it's useful for a number of reasons. Uh, obviously, if you want to share your map with another Global Mapper user, this single file can be used to distribute data. On the recipient's uh, machine, it will recreate your entire workspace. They will essentially see exactly what you've created, same colors, same uh, data structure, everything will be there. So as a method for sharing data, extremely useful. In fact, it's the only efficient way to do this among Global Mapper users. The other benefit of this as a sidebar is as a data backup. Tool. I, I travel a lot. We go to a lot of conferences and training classes. I don't travel without my data in a package file because who knows what's going to happen to my hard drive. I always have that data on a flash drive that I can plug into a new installation of the software and I know all of my data will be there. So think of this as a way to back up your data. Uh, park it on your network or park it on a remote server. Worst case is if you if your laptop hard drive fries, you've got your data all pre-structured. So global mapper package files. I'll just go ahead and bring up the dialog box so we can see exactly how, how this looks. And when you actually imported or digitized, you will see a I'm going to start from the right uh, where we have an export bounds. Now, by default, it's going to export everything that I've loaded. But you can define the bounds of what's exported based on a box, based on known coordinates, or perhaps the most common, and uh, Cassie alluded to this earlier, defined by the extent of an area feature. 
Maybe you've drawn a rectangle or drawn a circle or drawn something that defines your area of interest. You can limit the export to just what's in that area. We use that one a lot. So export bounds. Tiling. Most useful if you're dealing with uh, large areas of perhaps imagery or raster data where you don't want to have to deal with large files. Tiling allows you to create, as the name implies, tiles of data. Multiple tiles as opposed to a single tile. Um, depending on the format of data, and this is obviously a Global Mapper package uh, specific to Global Mapper, uh, we're going to have options pertaining to that particular format. And as you'll see here, uh, the options we can set reflect this particular selection, uh, projection information, um, some other checkboxes at the bottom. You can read through these and determine what's useful or what's not useful. So Global Mapper package, highly recommended for sharing data. Well, obviously, there are going to be occasions when you need to share data with non-Global Mapper users. Well, your job is to convince them to use Global Mapper in the first place. That's job number one. If you can't do that and if they're using some other software, then you will have to export the data in a format that's uh, um, compatible and applicable for that. And right uh, under the you will have a number of additional options. The features we've just drawn on the screen are vector features, so I'm going to choose to export these in a vector format. And when I do, I'm asked to choose which format. I'm going to choose Shapefile, because we know it's a common format in the GIS industry. So we'll choose Shapefile. And again, we'll see a list of options that pertain to generating shapefiles. These are unique to this format. We have the export bounds and the tiling, as before. Um, we have a new function that was added just within the last month or so, Attribute Setup. You can define the attribute structure, the more advanced tool. Um, in my case, I only have areas on the screen, so I'm only going to be exporting areas. Again, we can define some of the attribute options, whether to generate a projection file. Uh, we click OK, it will prompt us to name the file, and we're good. One housekeeping note here as far as export is concerned. When you go through an export process, Global Mapper assumes that you're going to export everything in every layer. That, that's the default behavior. Uh, in other words, if I had two parcel layers, one of which was one town, another one was another town, and they were both displayed on my screen, Global Mapper would assume I was going to export a combined file. In other words, if your workflow is combining multiple files into one, Default behavior. If your intention is to have multiple files displayed but only export a specific file, you will want to uncheck what you don't need. And as you'll see in the Overlay Control Center, it's simply a case of unchecking the adjacent tech checkbox, and that, that layer will disappear. It will only export what it sees. So if you have two layers, one of which is unchecked, the only layer that will be exported would be the layer that's, uh, uh, that's on screen right now, that's visible on screen. So we have export options for elevation data, raster or imagery data, or vector data. We've even got a whole subsection for web data. And in previous webinars, we've actually demonstrated this. It's a very, very efficient tool for sharing data, being able to publish it to a website. And we have a tool that will allow you to create files that are compatible with web mapping services. You can also write data into a special database, uh, read and write. Uh, we just recently added uh, um, Microsoft SQL uh, as a supported format. Arc SDE is in there. Oracle Spatial is in there as well. Those of you who work you may be able to pull data in to Global Mapper from your databases, manipulate, and then write it by card again, so you don't have to go to, to the file level. Finally, I want to talk about PDFs. Um, we can generate a PDF. Um, we're all familiar with PDFs. We probably use them on a daily basis. But the PDFs that are generated within Global Mapper are special types of PDFs. They're actually geospatial PDFs. They retain their geographic intelligence. In other words, if receives a PDF that you have created and they load it up into the free version of uh, Acrobat Reader, they will be able to initiate the geographic tools in there and do things like geographic measurement or even visualizing the coordinates of their cursor. So it's a geographically intelligent PDF that's exported. Uh, PDFs by uh, default will also allow you to manage layers and use Adobe Acrobat Reader as the viewer. Again, another extremely efficient way for sharing data. And I wouldn't be uh, in no sharing to support printing as well. Often a neglected component of the software, but a very strong component nonetheless, is the ability to generate printed maps. Um, there is a section of our 
toolbar option uh, that allows you to define the setup of your printed map. The fourth button in from the left hand side allows me to put things like a title on my map, a legend if it's appropriate, and all other sorts of elements can be added to my map to make it cartographically pleasing. So you can generate a uh, high quality uh, map for printing purposes. And obviously, you know, dep depending on the printer you have connected, it's simply a case of going to the print dialog post dialog box and allow you to your map. So there are multiple ways of getting data out of Global Mapper as there are multiple ways of getting data into Global Mapper. That hour has been useful for you if you're a novice user, giving you some information that will allow you to use the software to its uh, maximum ability. Again, we talked about our registration process. Very simple, very streamlined. We continue to uh, make efforts to improve that process. We know a little bit about some of the configuration options, getting data in, a little bit about our file management. Don't forget what workspaces are. They're extremely important. Uh, we talked about the digitizer. And obviously at the end, we talked about uh, exporting or sharing data. And with that, we're going to wrap up for the day. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to, to spend some time with us today. Um, in the uh, next few days, I think we're going to be sending an announcement about uh, upcoming webinars, or, or webinars in March. Uh, so keep an eye on your inbox. If you're not currently subscribed, uh, you can go to our website and get that information as well. Great. Thank you, David. And yes, if you would like to sign up early uh, for our next webinar, uh, please visit the Blue Marble website. Uh, hopefully our support team was able to answer any questions you may have asked, and if not, we'll be sure to follow up with you uh, directly as soon as we can. Um, you'll uh, also see our support address, our email address, which is geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com. Uh, so feel free to send in any questions you may have um, to that inbox, uh, and we'll address those directly as well. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to mention the forum as well. If, for those of you who have not been Global Mappers, uh, Global Mappers, Global Mapper users for a while, uh, there is a very active uh, forum. Um, please visit the forum. Um, it's great for browsing through some of the topics, maybe giving you a little more information on how to use the software, or for posting your own questions if you have specific questions. We have a lot of folks in, the, in our company that answer that. A lot of folks outside as well participate and help each other. So Global Mapper Forum, an excellent resource for, uh, for you, uh, getting familiar with the software. Um, we are recording this webinar today as we do with all of our webinars. Uh, this uh, will be posted. Give us a, a couple of days and we'll post this on our website. Uh, feel free to share this with your other users or come back and the um, PDF document, the Getting Started Guide, if you need some uh, more information. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Cassandra, for your help with the webinar today. Great. Thank you, David, and uh, we look forward to speaking uh, with all of you again next month.